has started. And then next, um, if you'd like to, uh, Dr. Brooks, you can bring up your slides as I'm introducing you. Sure, thank you. So Dr. Brooks Carthon received a Master of Science, yes. Can you enable me to oh, share I'm screen? So it's okay. Give me just a moment here. Oh, okay. Oh, here we go. Okay, you should be able to now. Okay. Dr. Briggs Carthon received, first of all, I'm sorry, welcome everybody this afternoon. Uh, and let me introduce you to Dr. Brooks Carthon, who received a Master of Science in Nursing in Psychiatric and Adult Health from the University of Pittsburgh, a PhD in Nursing from the University of Pennsylvania, and completed postdoctoral training in the Barbara Bates Center for the Study of History and the Center for Health Outcomes and Policy Research at Penn. Dr. Margaret Brooks Carthon joined the standing faculty of the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing in 2010 and is an associate professor and core faculty of the Center for Health Outcomes and Policy Research. Her scholarship includes nursing outcome, outcomes uh, research focused on the relationship between organization of nursing and health disparities among vulnerable populations. She is among the first to generate evidence that racial disparities and hospital-based outcomes are associated with poor nursing care quality. Dr. Brooks Carthon is equally regarded as a thought leader in nursing workforce diversity. She has been instrumental in the creation of national policies to address diversity and inclusion in nursing education. She is a Robert Wood Johnson Nurse Faculty Scholar, a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, and in 2021, she was named the Tyson Family Term Chair in Gerontological Research. So thank you, uh, Dr. Brooks Carthon, for joining us uh, via Zoom. Um, she has requested that along the way, if you have any um, questions um, or, or thoughts that you would like to share uh, that you should feel free to um, ask those questions. So the way we're going to do this, because it's the way I, I figured out how to do it, is you'll submit your question and then I'll al allow you um, to uh, ask it live. So submit your question via the Q&A um, button at the bottom. Um, or you can simply say, I have a question. If you want to just type in, I have a question, and then I'll allow, I'll allow you to um, uh, ask your question along the way. It's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Lucero. It's so good to be with you. So good to be with UCLA School of Nursing for your EDI lecture. Um, as I mentioned to Dr. Lucero, I'm really hoping that this can be a conversation. Uh, I, I think that I uh, really gain as much from being in conversation and community with you as I hope that you'll draw from our time together. Uh, and so as Dr. Lucero mentioned, by way of my biography, I am uh, trained as a health equity or health disparities researcher. I am trained as a nurse and as a nurse practitioner. Uh, and it is through those lenses that today I'll talk to you about a journey that I've been on uh, that's really looking to translate research to equity-centered innovation. And in the notice that Dr. Lucero sent you, he said, this talk is about hospital to home transitions. And it is, but it isn't. It's really about thinking about the way to make impact to some of the inequitable outcomes that we see every day. The hospital to home transition clinical pathway is an example of what our team is doing. Um, but this journey is one that I think many uh, clinicians are on, many researchers are on, and it's really how do we impact? How do we make impact? How do we go from noting disparities among 
historically marginalized population to moving the needle. And, and really that's what was the catalyst for me in terms of beginning this journey on innovation and intervention was feeling a bit of frustration at how entrenched health disparities and inequitable outcomes, particularly for communities of color appear to be and really wanting to be a part of that change. So it's one of the reasons that I want you to be able to ask questions because this may be something that you're experiencing or that you have a burning desire, but you also may have questions. So just feel free to basically interject as you see fit. And so I just wanna begin by talking a little bit about what brought me to this topic of health equity. Um, Dr. Lucera mentioned that I am a nurse um, and that is the background that I bring to all of my work. My training as a nurse, my training as a nurse practitioner, my work in community. And so over the past 20 plus years, I've spent exactly one year in a hospital as a nurse. All of the rest of my nursing and my practice as a nurse practitioner has been in community or ambulatory care settings. And it was really during the time practicing in community or in private offices as a nurse practitioner that I was able to see close up that there were some people who were able to navigate the healthcare system with more ease. And what I mean by that is that there seemed to be some people who could access their appointments, get to our office without a problem. If I wrote a prescription, they were able to you know, fill it. If we needed them to see another specialist, they were able to easily get an appointment. But at the same time, I could see other patients who might have different health insurance like Medicaid or who might be from minority backgrounds who had typically a much, uh, much more challenge one, just getting to us. If they had to depend on uh, medical transport, they may have to wait up to two hours to get picked up. If we wrote a prescription, we'd have to go through more pre-authorization. And sometimes I'd have to just work with pharmaceutical reps to ask for additional samples to get them through the month. And if we needed them to see another specialist, it was more challenging because for us, Medicaid as a payer is a lower payer. And so while we might be able to have a specialist see a person that we needed them to see with Medicaid, the appointments would likely be placed further out. And so seeing these things in real practice, which I kind of regard as kind of, you know, two tiers of healthcare, I was also able to think about the ways that I as a nurse or a nurse practitioner was able to serve as an advocate. And so I was able to call medical transportation to say, you can't have people stay for two, two hours. You have to be here to pick them up after a visit. And I was also able to talk to pharmaceutical reps and to our colleagues to get patients seen quicker. And it helped me to reflect. And so this is my first reflection point on the role as Margot. So this is just me as a nurse and as a nurse practitioner that also made me wondered about the role of nurses as being kind of a facilitator or a catalyst to addressing some of these health inequities. One, because we are in really close contact with patients and two, we have knowledge of the infrastructure and the way healthcare systems work. So I think of us as being in this really kind of crucial space where we might be able to help support uh, people who are really trying to na navigate the labyrinth of healthcare. And so that kind of aha moment led me to um, thinking about pursuing a PhD. And, and it's actually where Dr. Lucero and I meet. Um, so he didn't mention in the biography that we've known each other for a long time and that we were classmates, but I will let you know that we were classmates at Penn. And in some of the early work that I was interested in was very much central to the idea of wanting to understand the root causes of health and equity. And so I've been trained as a historian and use historical methods because I really wanted to understand more about what I was seeing in practice, but also what I grew up knowing to be true is that people in my community seem to not only get sicker more, but when they had to engage with the healthcare system, it always was fraught with tension and confusion. What I learned from this early work is that nothing biologically helped to determine that those outcomes would occur, right? It was nothing about being a minority per se that predestined them to poor outcomes, but it was everything about the way 
health and uh, health resources were structured and embedded within a context of systemic inequities related to environments where people live, neighborhoods, access, education, and economic resources. And so now we hear a lot about structural racism, which is defined as kind of these differences in the way resources are allocated and delivered that systematically advantage one group over another. But what we're talking about now as structural racism, we know that these things are rooted historically. And so in a lot of my early work, this is what I was interested in uncovering because for me, history isn't a blueprint, it's a teacher. And so from that perspective, it really helps ground me to think about the areas that I wanted to really explore in more detail. And so over the last decade, much of what I've been interested in exploring is healthcare systems. And the reason I'm interested in healthcare systems um, is because it's within healthcare systems that we can see where people access, like this is a nexus of accessing healthcare. It's a nexus of providers interacting with people. It's a nexus of looking at the way healthcare resources are organized. It's a nexus of seeing who the composition of the workforce is. And it's a nexus of understanding who is providing or not culturally appropriate care. So this is a really kind of rich area. And that's not to, um, minimize the role in the research for you know scholars who are looking at the built environment or neighborhoods um, i think that health disparities emerge from really complex interactions and so it really is incumbent on us to understand how they intersect um, but for the remainder of my talk today i'm going to talk a lot about the healthcare system and the ways in which health inequities are born in many respects out of systemic failures, right? We enter a healthcare system, I also say, you shouldn't be surprised when people who are minoritized or socially vulnerable or economically disadvantaged, we shouldn't be surprised when the healthcare system doesn't work for them because it wasn't built for them. And so these systemic failures that we're going to talk about, they render people vulnerable who've already experienced historic trauma and racism. And so in coming to healthcare systems, they may require more time and attention and the way the healthcare system allocates resources, it may be that they don't get the care they need. And so one of the reasons that my research looks at nursing in particular is not actually because I'm a nurse and it's not because of what I saw in practice, though I do, those kind of were organizing frameworks. Like I see this in my practice. I think nursing plays this important role, but I also think about nursing as a metaphor, right? Nursing as metaphor. Um, nurses, particularly in hospitals are, they are 24 seven systems. Like there's always a nurse working in a hospital, right? The reason people come to a hospital is because they need access to really intense nursing care. Elsewise, they could be at their homes. So if nursing resources are not properly allocate, allocated, it may influence the way in which a system is able to respond to the needs of patients. And so what my research you know, attempts to explore is if nursing resources are not optimally allocated, does it render already vulnerable populations more vulnerable and place them at higher risk for poor outcomes? And so poorly allocated nursing resources would be an example of a systemic failure or would at least lead to systemic failures and outcomes because nurses who are trained to be able to attend to acute challenges and social needs and psychosocial challenges and you know, patient education and discharge planning, if all of those things can't to come together, um, and if any of those clinical care needs is missed, it may render individuals at high risk for poor outcomes. And so I love this infographic because you see the nurse caring for a patient, but you also see a nurse who is responsible for quite a number of other things, things that you probably recognize, prescribing medication or administering medication. Uh, administrative tasks, transportation, documentation. And so all of these are things 
that nurses or clinical care and some of it's administrative that nurses are responsible for. Um, but when having to take care of these other administrative and or clinical items may render people who need additional care at higher risk for poor outcomes. So let me just set the stage. Um, many times when racial and ethnic minorities, and this is irrespective irrespective of clinical etiology, when they are hospitalized, they're more likely to experience a poor outcome. And I say economically disadvantaged too, because they too have a higher burden of poor outcomes related to readmissions, compli complications, mortality, patient satisfaction. And so irrespective of the etiology and irrespective of the outcomes, socially vulnerable patients are at higher risk. And so now again, the question is, is there something about the allocation or misallocation of nursing resources that may render them more vulnerable? And so many of you may be familiar with the work of Linda Aiken and many, many others who've shown this relationship between adequate staffing and work environments and patient outcomes. And, and we've heard this throughout COVID. Throughout COVID, we know that nurses have been stressed and pressed and because of the workload of nurses, there have been dire concerns over patient safety and outcomes. And so while we've noticed this during COVID, this concern over safe staffing is one that is predated by many, many, many decades. And in fact, California is one of the few states in the country that actually mandates nurse to patient ratios in any way. And so over the past 10 years, our team has asked this question, uh, which basically builds on Aiken and colleagues work to say, we understand that staffing and work environments influence outcomes for all of us, we all bear, but is there additional risk? Are there um, additional uh, burdens that minorities may face when nurse staffing or workloads are higher for nurses. And we've, we've asked this question across a number of studies. In stroke patients, we've asked about the relationship between older Black ischemic stroke patients and nurse staffing. We've asked the same question in in-hospital cardiac arrest patients, post-surgical uh, post patients and staffing, We've also asked about the effects of missed nursing care. And by missed nursing care, we ask when nurses are unable to attend to all the critical tasks that they are required to do during a shift, does it render older black myocardial infarction patients at higher risk for a readmission? And so what we found systematically across these studies and more is that in the hospitals with the most intense nurse staffing resources, disparities between racial and ethnic minorities is diminished. I say ethnic minorities because we, had, uh, we have a student who looked at these same relationships in older Hispanic patients. She's working on a paper that shows a very, very similar pattern. And so what does this mean? And let me talk a little bit more about what this looks like. So this paper was written 10 years ago. This was the first paper that we did that showed this relationship. It was published in the journal of the American Geriatric Society and asked whether there was a relationship between staffing levels and post-surgical mortality in older Black patients. We wanted to know, did older Black patients experience a higher odds of death after surgery? And did that disparity decrease when they were cared for by nurses who have a lower workload? And so here you see workloads at three patients a nurse, four patients a nurse, five patients a nurse, six patients a nurse, seven patients. You see black patients have a higher risk of mortality. Here's mortality. You see higher mortality. And we also see higher mortality when nurses have higher workloads. Of interest, you see that when workloads are lower, meaning fewer patients per nurse, the risk of mortality not only lessens, but it decreases below that of whites in the presence of more intense nursing resources. So that's interesting, right? Um, and so we thought that this was an interesting finding and, and one of the first of its kind to show this empirical relationship 
which again, we know everyone benefits from having better staffing. Um, you can see that mortality indeed decreases for white patients, but that slope and the magnitude is certainly much more notable for older Black patients. And we think because older Black patients come with a higher level of risk, both because of more chronic comorbidities and that the intensity of nursing care to attend to those needs, be they clinical or psychosocial, um, or the need for coordination, et cetera, is heightened in these more intense nursing dyads and that some of those needs are addressed. We found a similar, so that was 2012, this is 2021. So these are bookend studies with lots in between. We said, okay, well, that was a mortality, surgical, new population, let's see. In hospital cardiac arrests are interesting because cardiac arrests are highly protocolized, right? Someone calls a code, we respond in a specific way. There really shouldn't be that much variation because the way we call a code should be pretty consistent. We know it's not across hospitals and we know that the variation in the way that uh, in-hospital cardiac arrest is managed leads to poor survival, particularly among black patients. Again, nurses are very much important in the response to a cardiac arrest in the hospital. They are the most likely to note and call the code, and they have a lot of different roles within the response to a cardiac arrest. Similarly, we know that Black patients are less likely to survive a code, but in the presence of more intense resources, the disparity is, does, is not fully mitigated, but it is attenuated. And so the disparity gap is lessened in the presence of better staffing. So we're starting to see a pattern. Again, that's two studies. This is research. I'm someone who wants to look at the question from multiple angles. You know I looked at this as a historian. The work I just showed you was highly quantitative. The way we do that quantitative work is by asking nurses lots and lots of nurses, thousands of nurses. So I'll go back here because I don't think I mentioned. We asked thousands of nurses who are working in hospitals about the quality of where they're working. So they're like the canary in the coal mine. They tell us what's going on, how many patients they're caring for, what's the quality of that setting. And then patients are put in that same hospital. So nurses are employed, patients are cared for, and we do a series of analytic tests to see if there is an association between what nurses tell us and what people experience, right? So these are associations. It's not causal, but we're getting kind of a consistent pattern because we've seen this in five or six studies over the last 10 years. But, but again, let's ask nurses because one of the things that we hypothesize is that some of the needs, particularly social needs, which is really important, if you think historically, we said that the reasons that we think minorities are experiencing higher odds of poor outcomes is because of these structural determinants of health. And so these unmet social needs are potentially unmet during the shifts that nurses are working. And in this particular qualitative study of acute care nurses, we sought to ask that when you're caring for socially at risk patients, you know, are you able to address those needs? And are there barriers, organizational barriers that might prevent you from addressing the needs when uncovered. And so this was a single level one trauma center here in Philadelphia, six focus groups, 21 nurses, qualitative descriptive study, content analysis. We asked, do you feel empowered to do something when social needs are identified? A series of other questions. If social needs are uncovered, how do you address these problems? And does providing care for patients with high social needs prevent any challenges? And we also wanted to know, you know, what kind of resources do you have to address these challenges? And nurses told us, you're lucky if you feel like they have even understood their discharge instructions. So this is like much less addressing these social needs. Like we're trying to focus on kind of medical stabilization. We're lucky. A lot of times there are big question marks. Those are question marks. They're referring to these social needs. And that's why a lot of times the patients come back. So they're telling us like, we can't even address some of these other problems. Another person, when we said, well, how do you address these problems? They said, well, I might like give them some extra socks or some extra food, but that's a Band-Aid if there ever was one. 
And finally, when asked about, you know, what about those organizational challenges or barriers? Another nurse said, I think giving us time to actually take care of patients, I think that patients would feel much better and feel more comfortable if you had time to actually interact more. And that was really, reson that resonated with us because a lot of nurses told us that one of the things if they had to ration or miss care, the thing that they missed the most was actually communicating with patients, building relationships with them. And we know that in order to create trust in patient-centered or patient-aligned goals of care, that it takes time to really develop a rapport to be able to ensure that your treatment is concordant with the values, beliefs, and preferences of patients that we're caring for. So this told us, and it kind of gave some meat to the quantitative work we were doing about what exactly do nurses feel like they're not able to do when they have people or patients with high social needs. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to do is so much of this focus had been on nurses and nurses' perspectives. We also wanted to know, so what about older Black patients? What are they experiencing related to nursing care quality during hospitalization? And to do this, we talked to individuals who lived in the community who had experienced a hospitalization, and we asked them, tell us about the nursing care you received during your hospitalization. It just happened within the last four weeks. Tell us what your experience was. We did this over the course of a year. We talked to 19 African-Americans who lived in West Philadelphia. Again, this was a qualitative descriptive design. And we said, you know, how or what things do you wish your nurse had more time to do for you? How important would you rate the following tasks provided to you by your nurse? And can you tell me about how nurses responded to you when you had questions or concern? And so one individual said, well, sometimes they give you instructions and you don't understand your instructions. They just run through it real fast and hand it to you for you to take home and deal with it. Um, another person said, well, it would be nice if they had more time to devote for each of their patients, but they don't. They're on the fast track. They got to get this done. They maybe have 25 or 30 people they have to wait on on the ward. And I thought that this was particularly interesting because if you think your nurse has 25 other people to take care of, it may lessen whether you want to burden them with the question. And that was one of the things that was so apparent that these were people who didn't want to ask a lot of nurses that they already viewed as really, really busy. And as nurses, even if we say we're not busy with our mouths, we know how our body language confers I'm busy. And so in many ways, it could make people lessen questions or concerns that they have because they don't wanna put upon us. So really interesting. The other interesting thing about this is that I, I say like when there's smoke, there's fire, right? So when nurses are telling us there's smoke, there's a problem, they're right right? Like they're telling us there's a problem. And older Black patients were like, yeah, they're not able to do it. They're handing me my discharge instructions and I just got to go home to deal with it. And I don't want to bother them, but I leave with these questions. And so it was really important for us to see that what we were noticing was a problem that was experienced by people, it, it particularly marginalized people with marginalized conditions, but that care rationing and omissions because of a lack of resources was rendering them as more vulnerable, but that these disparities could be potentially diminished in better resourced hospitals, which is suggestive of a system-based solution, right? And I love this, uh, this picture. I don't love what it says, but it says PPE for nurses, what we need versus what we have. But for me, I think about like when we're thinking about caring for people who have increased social needs, it's like what we need is increased resources and time and intensity of services. And what we have is probably a band-aid. So those are my reflections. And this is where I get to a point where I am deeply, deeply dismayed. I'm deeply, deeply dismayed. I've been doing this for a decade. So I showed you 2012, I showed you 2021, those are two studies. So I'm in this for 10 years, but really before, because there was work I was doing as a historian. And I'm asking myself, 
is, am I going to do this for another 10 years? Because I've literally shown the same relationship across five or six different populations. And I've shown it not just in hospitals, I've shown it in primary care as well. There's work I haven't even shown you all about nurse practitioners and older Black patients who have coronary artery disease, who are at higher risk for hospitalization because they're not getting their preventative screening because they're in work environments that don't support the work of nurse practitioners. So the descriptive correlations and associations between nursing and people who experience or at high risk for poor outcomes is consistent. But my desire to continue to describe these associations was really, really frustrating me, in part because we know that the research to translation to practice pipe long, pipeline is long, up to 17 years. So in 17 years, I have a secret. I'm going to retire if I'm lucky. So I don't have time <laughs> to wait for 17 years for something I published to finally make its way into practice. And, and so this is my next reflection. It really, really was about what am I going to do? Because I need to figure out a way to start to take what I think I know and work with other folks who may know more so that we can start to impact change. So I think this, this is an ironic I think this is an ironic slide. So it's like Dr. Brooks Carthon is one of Penn Innovations Fellow and is a rising star of healthcare research. I think it's ironic because this is, she's a rising star, but at the same time, I was feeling deeply, deeply conflicted. And I was not feeling like a star. I was feeling like somewhat of a failure. Like, how am I going to impact change? Like, I don't feel like a star. I feel deflated because the work I do is not about me. I don't care about these accolades. I don't care about being a star. I care about people and community and making a change. Me being a star is of little value to me. The, some of the most remarkable work I've done has been in a clinic talking to people. You will never know who they are. That is what matters to me. And so this is kind of another reflection and inflective point for me and, you know, probably for you as well, if you're interested in this work related to equity, is your purpose, right? Because sometimes your purpose is not popular. I've done this work for a long time and equity and structural racism, this is not hot, right? It might be for a moment, but I can tell you 10 or 15 years ago, these are not topics that everyone was hungry to hear. And so sometimes it can be lonely and sometimes you can feel like you're really out there on your own. Um, and, and so for me, I really had to ask myself, do I want to keep showing these relationships or do I need to figure out how to make impact? And I wasn't trained to do interventions. You know, I started out as a historian and I use health services research as a tool to understand these relationships. And I also had to deal with my own fear, right? My fear of really trying something new and different but this is just kind of where I was. I was like, I'm not waiting 17 years for impact and I'm not gonna keep doing this thing, you know, this journey of accolades and rising stars if it's not gonna have purpose and impact. And, and that is when I was awarded this Innovations Fellowship, which for me was this opportunity to say, I need to know how to implement new ideas to get to change faster because classically trained research is methodical, but it can also be slow, particularly when you think about funding and revisions and working with healthcare systems is different because they work on a different clock and a different sense of urgency. So the work I wanted to do is directly situated with working in partnership with healthcare systems who really have a different kind of, like I said, a different sensibility about trying things and really trying things quickly and failing fast so that if you're gonna work or if it's not gonna work, you're gonna know and you're gonna be able to implement scale or de-implement and don't try it. So this is where I was in terms of um, kind of like the research to innovation. So I'm using my research. I also have to say the ways in which research can um, make you a little bit vulnerable to your own sense of knowledge. Like I'd done all of this work for the last decade. So when I came into this innovations fellowship with the Center for Healthcare Innovation, I said, listen, I think that nurses and organizations and, you know, this is where the action is and we need to do it. 
And my mentors and research said, if, or in innovation said, if you come in with the solution in mind, you're not open to innovation. Like you already came in and you think you know what the answer is. The process of innovation development is all about explore, exploration. It's about stakeholder involvement. It's about gaining perspective. And so for me, it really was kind of this purposeful undoing in a lot of ways in terms of the way that I've been training, which allowed me to partner with others to really think deeply about how do we impact change. And so at the same time, I was a, a part of this innovations fellowship. Our team was awarded a small grant to put together a work group. And so what you see here are other people who were on this innovation journey with me. So I told you that I kind of was afraid because I felt like I was stepping out on a limb by myself. But in working with healthcare and community partners, I saw that I'm not the only one who had a deep desire to improve the care and service delivery for people who were experiencing poor transitions, but who also were having poor outcomes. And so they were either coming back to the hospital or their uh, trajectory after hospitalization was not, um, it wasn't healing and it wasn't optimal. And so everyone you see on this slide and many, many more, I need to update the slide because there've been so many more people who've helped in this journey. But these are the folks who were early in the process of asking the same questions. How might we, how can we improve the outcomes of people who are hospitalized? Some of them are nurses, but Kendall Williams and Marty Camp are physicians. Ashley is a social worker. Um, Eileen is a case manager. Jesse is a biostatistician and Javon is a senior manager for our community health workers. And so what you see here is diversity, obviously in the composition racially, and, uh, but you also see interdisciplinary colleagues who surprisingly probably to all of us have more alike than unalike in terms of our interest in this population. And so when we came together, our goal was really to understand the healthcare challenges that patients with complex social needs face. And I will say that complex social needs in our hospital at Penn Presbyterian, where this work took place, are largely disproportionately Black and African American. The hospital where we work, uh, where we do our work is a safety net. It's located in West Philadelphia. And so I say complex social needs because those complex social needs are the marginalizing factors for a population that happens to be Black and African American. But we knew that these social needs were the undercurrent. And we wanted to figure out what facet to address. We also needed to understand, and obviously this is the historian in me, like what's already in place, right? Like what have we done historically? What are we doing now to address these needs? And how do we co-develop solutions, not just with the folks here in this picture, but also with people who live in the community who would experience healthcare at Presby. So again, this work is occurring out of Penn Presbyterian, we call it Presby. Presby is a level one trauma, it's a safety net. It's located in an Obama promise zone and the Obama administration in about 2014 designated a number of promise zones in part because of social blight and concerns over economic disadvantage, but also because there was a deep sense of promise in these communities. And if you know West Philadelphia, um, if you know Will Smith, like West Philadelphia born and raised and the playground is where I spent all of my days. So there is a long and deep, rich commitment to community and family in West Philadelphia. And so it's really ripe for kind of this community and systems based work because there is kind of like my grandmother, you know, was born in West Philly and, you know, was born in one of the hospitals locally. So there really is kind of this familiar rootedness to the hospitals. In order to do this work, we had a framework, and this is a human-centered design framework. It has four phases, discovery, define, develop, and deliver. Design thinking is kind of the undercurrent to innovation. I have to say the whole notion of innovation to me was kind of otherworldly. Like if you'd asked me what was innovative, I would have pointed to my cell phone. I just didn't have a deep sense of like what innovation was because it felt like a buzzword. And so for me, 
learning about innovation as this kind of straightforward problem solving approach was one that kind of resonated with me because I didn't have to go back and get another dissertation. I was able to learn the steps in a very straightforward way. And we were able to apply it as a team and a community because it really began with understanding what people were experiencing when they went through the healthcare system. We needed to define like who we wanted to focus on because this is a pretty big population. We needed to develop and test a number of solutions. But before we got to test, we needed to kind of brainstorm and ideate. So I think I see a question in the chat. Do you see it too, Dr. Lucero? That's, I think that that's a comment just for you. Oh, okay. Okay. So I won't, won't read it out loud then, I think <laughs> Um, so I am in the next five minutes or so going to walk through our process, but I really am going to spend the most of our time talking about where we landed. We used a number of intensive approaches to really understand more about the population we hope to serve and to support. We did focus groups, we did one-on-one -on -one interviews, we did probably about 80 hours of field work, really trying to understand the illness experience. During this time, we met Andre, and I will just tell you, meeting Andre in his home, he just had a bowel resection and a col colostomy bag, a new colostomy bag, and it was clear that Andre was not cleaning the bag, he was changing it every day, and so we knew he would run out of supplies early. We asked him, did he have specialty care and did he have a follow-up appointment with his surgeon? And he said he did, but it would take him 90 minutes one way to get there. And we asked about his diet and he said it was mostly eggs and spaghetti. We asked, you know, did he have primary care? And he said, no, I wasn't sick before I went to the hospital, so I don't have primary care. And when we asked him, well, you know, you're probably going to run out of your uh, colostomy bags because you're not cleaning them. He was like, this is so gross. I can't even look at it. So wasn't cleaning it, was changing it. And when we said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go down to the emergency department. They'll give me some new bags if I run out. So this was kind of like this perfect example. The goals of care for self-care were not consistent with what Andre, this clearly is not his picture, uh, what um, his own goals were. His goal was to return to work. And so nothing that was occurring in this was a setup for him to return to work. And there was really a lot of challenges related to how he would get specialty care, connections to primary care, living in a food desert, a desire to return to work with a new colostomy, and really, really just a, not a great understanding of how to care for this new surgical site and appliance that he now came home with. And again, it just made us think, how could we, before Andre had come home, set him up for success? We knew that there wasn't a good process in place. Like we, we spent a lot of times on the units. We saw that, you know, really, if we asked nurses across four units, how would you care for someone who had significant social needs? We get four different replies. We knew that social risk factors were not formally assessed or addressed because really, if you uncover a problem in the hospital, one of their questions is, well, what are we supposed to do about it? Like, I don't know how to keep their lights on. I can't find them somewhere to live. And so sometimes they might avoid asking these questions because they don't have the solution. We also knew that there was not great communication between inpatient and community-based providers of any kind. So I'm going to fast forward. This here, you know, when you think about people with social needs and a safety net, you could be thinking about 75% of the population. When you're thinking about a clinical pathway, it's important to be uh, to define that population a little bit more. And so for us, that meant we needed to use some more data to really drill down. And in so doing, in that drill down, we were able to use analytic tools to really allow us to focus on a population that could use additional support. For us, that population by and large were Medicaid insured, which is why the support that we provide is for those who are insured by Medicaid. 24% of patients who come into our medicine service are Medicaid insured, 
but 45% of those individuals are among those who are readmitted within 30 days. So that's disproportionate number of Medicaid insured, meaning low income patients who are disproportionately Black or African American, 80%. And so we see a minoritized, uh, economically uh, disadvantaged population coming back to the hospital repeatedly. And so let me talk a little bit more about that in terms of where we ended up going in terms of intervention. And so we did a lot of work, and I mean a lot of work, <laughs> to come up with a pathway. This is what our process of ideation looks like, where we're thinking about all the ways that we could try to intervene, all of our ideas, putting it all out there on the table. And while it ends up looking like a pathway, I just wanted to make sure you knew that the process of brainstorming required a lot of ideas and some editing. What happens with this support program through Thrive is individuals like Andre are now identified while in the hospital using the algorithm that we came up with. That algorithm is now embedded into the healthcare system's electronic health record, and it helps case managers identify people who have multiple chronic comorbidities and Medicaid insurance while they're in the hospital. Case managers then provide a Thrive referral. Thrivers are then seen by a uh, home-based nurse within 24 to 48 hours after discharge. That home care nurse does an assessment, helps to address social needs. Um, all Thrive uh, participants now also get a social work referral. One of the important aspects of Thrive that many other transitional programs do not have is that this nurse is able to have a post-discharge conversation with the hospitalist who works or who just previously discharged the Thrive participant. And we think this is important because many people who are participants in Thrive may have tenuous relationships with primary care and those days and weeks right after discharge are very vulnerable and it's helpful for a nurse to be able to call to clarify orders, to talk about symptoms in real time and to do medication uh, reconciliation. In addition to this, our intensive coordination team meets once a week to talk about each person on the Thrive Pathway to ensure that needs are met and that nothing falls through the cracks. And on, their call, on these calls, there's someone from home care, there's someone from acute care, there's someone from our research team, there's someone from social work, there's someone from community health workers, and everyone is really giving concentrated time and attention to anyone on the Thrive Pathway. So, so can we stop there? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> We have questions coming in. Okay. And we only have about seven minutes left. Okay. So our first question um, and or comment is um, from uh, Dr. Holly Devon. Hi, Holly. Hello. Thank you so much. This is just fascinating. Also, I, I really like this Thrive intervention. I think it could work in so many different pa patient populations. But my question is related to some of your research that you reported a few minutes back. And that is many of the problems with serving uh, disadvantaged populations and health equity are systems-based, as you noted. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering after um, all these studies, you know, rather, and, I'm not saying anybody is blaming nurses, but a lot of times it, it makes it work, look like we're not doing our jobs when we're, we ourselves are unable to do what we want to do and know what is best. And so it seems to me one of the issues is most nurses work for health systems, right? Whether it's a hospital, clinic, or some other uh, form, mm -hmm. community-based. So I often, you know, that kind of get a little irritated when I keep hearing nurses referred to as beds, as in, for example, we don't have a sufficient number of beds, as you know, during the pandemic, um, you know, it was a bad situation, but it's not about beds. It's about the nurses who staff the so-called beds, which are also people, patients. Yeah. 
the people we're all trying to care for. So, I, I mean, will you reflect, because I'm not an expert in this area, I'm just, you know, a, a consumer of the literature mm -hmm. and wanting to do the best for patients as well. What do you think about this? Is there some way we could change the discussion? Mm -hmm. Rather, maybe we are, um, we are independent contractors rather than working for big health systems. I don't know. Well, what do you think about this issue? Yeah, I think there definitely, um, Holly is a messaging issue, right? That yeah. that nurses are kind of wrapped up into what the the beds and the equipment, like the cost and the value of nurses, and are we haven't been able to articulate the economic value of nurses' work because of the way it's wrapped up. You know, physicians and hospitals aren't paid the same way that nurses are, and so you mm -hmm. know if physicians aren't seeing people because their, their billing would change, right? The billing is a fee right. or a service or it's bundled into some type of capitation. And so for us, you know, it really is the economics of healthcare is what is driving a lot of what we're seeing. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things which uh, even the work that I do, people always say, well, what are the cost implications to this work, right? Be, and and I and right now I can't tell you what the cost implications are at Thrive, but I can tell you that's what the healthcare system cares about. And so, from a nursing perspective, I I think two things. You know, when I when I hear a lot of the conversations about safe staffing, I don't often hear it paired with equity, which is the pairing I make. Mm. Like safe staffing is important for everyone, but if we want to address equity, we have to address our human resource problem because our human resources aren't able to attend to the needs of people, most certainly not those that are vulnerable. But I also think there is an economic and a value proposition that we have to start making for nurses because the way our work is compensated has been too long, for too long, wrapped up into things that don't produce revenue. The beds don't produce, to your point, they don't care right. for patients and they don't produce revenue. And I don't know, how we make that leap. But I think that to your point, it's an important leap to make uh, because I think until we do, I mean, which is probably, we're at this pivot point now where we know it's economics because, you know, hospitals are paying a lot for travel nurses to provide care. So that's yes. an economic value proposition. They know now that they need <laughs> nurses and have been willing to pay a lot more, which some would argue means they could have paid more earlier for more nurses before this pandemic, but they were pressed and had to in the end. So this is such an interesting question, Holly. I'm sorry I took so much time and we don't have enough time to talk no, about it. No, thank you so Can much for us? doing, thanks for doing this important work. Thank best, you. best of luck to you. Thank you, Holly. I appreciate your question. It's such a great one. So we do have a little bit of time left for, for a quick question, if anybody has anything. Oh, someone just raised their hand. Go ahead, Glenda, you need to unmute yourself though. Okay, there you go, you're unmuted, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Lucero. Um, thank you so much for an informative uh, presentation and your life's dedication to studying this vulnerable population. Um, do you think it would be helpful to uh, initiate or insert a more financial or fiduciary, fiduciary content in all levels of nursing, especially APRNs, um, even the doctorate level? I don't really don't see that in a curricula. Um, I, I just think we could be we could help our discipline more in knowing how to talk finances and how healthcare systems work. So, yes, uh, and I I view that as a, that I feel like that's a limitation in my own scholarship. You know, I've taken classes with colleagues who were trained at Wharton. And I always say, we speak, our love language is not the same. Like what they talk about and what I think I talk about are light years away. And I don't know, I know, I, you know, I look at readmissions and ED utilization because I, 
I mean, yes, it's important to patients, but I know it's important to them. They want to prevent bounce back and readmissions and the ED from being clogged up. So that's one of the reasons I look at that. But I know my scholarship needs to take another leap because they want to know, does providing Thrive cost more or less than what they what a readmission would? And I need to start working with an economist. But more importantly, we have to start training our nurses our students in APRNs at every single level, how to make these economic calculations. They absolutely matter. And in healthcare systems, they really are driven. And in, especially in community-based safety nets where the financial margins are so very thin. And so really being able to make a business case is something I think is very, very important. And it's something I also recognize as really a shortcoming because I use a values with an S lens through equity. But when our healthcare partners are talking about value-based care, they are explicitly talking about cost. And yes, they care about quality, patient safety and equity, but cost is very much a driver. And it's one of the areas that I know that we as a collective, we have to, we have to strengthen because it's, it's how we we, we articulate to them in a way that they understand, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you, Glenda, for your question too. I'm so happy to have been with you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Lucero, for this invitation. It's been really a pleasure. All right, thank you everyone for joining. We're over time, but it's been uh, really enriching for me uh, to see the growth of this work. And uh, I hope everybody else um, learned something from this past hour as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.